Thank you, Gurinder. He was quite right about saying reservation was not introduced for Dalits by Dalits. It was. It was uh, if you even look at the modern history of reservation and concessions being given, it was in 1880s and 90s that uh, the when 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 the British uh, administration was there in India that they found that there were lots of people failing science class in Madras University and. Uh, Back then in the 1880s and 90s, it was predominantly Brahmins and other uh, uh, Dvija categories which were dominating higher education in India. And they wanted somehow to pass these people who were unable to pass after taking the exam again and again. So they created this division called third division, third class. This was specifically meant to facilitate Brahmins to just pass an exam. So if you really talk about compromising merit, that was historically the first instance when uh, the Brahmins demanded that merit be compromised with and one of their first struggles was to get into civil service and they weren't performing as well as uh, as they ought to be to get into civil service at a par with uh, the British recruits. So again they asked for concessions and uh, uh, was it Surindranath Banerjee was the first uh, civil servant, he got in with very few marks actually. So again there was concession given to a Brahmin. So if you really look at the history of it, it is in the name of, it, it, it's, it's as much as uh, the, the caste Hindus in India, the Brahminical classes in India who migrate to say London and then make use of affirmative action policies here and then say as part of the Equal Employment Opportunity Act or the Race Relations Act of 1973 in the UK, please let me into your institution, otherwise I'll put a case against you. But they would not admit to using reservation when they're doing it in the UK. They would, they would completely be opposed to it back in India, but right here they would want to make use of that provision and try to sneak in into jobs, which they would otherwise rightfully deny, or you know, with a, with a, right, with a righteousness rather, deny uh, their own uh, fellow human beings back in India. So reservation is a fraught issue, but it is still needed given that especially among Dalits, less than 2%, meaning 2 out of 100 people, are able to even get to a stage of education where they can access reservation in some form or the other. So if there's there, this whole meritocracy argument in India which says because Dalits are getting into jobs, uh, there's lack of performance, there's that, which is complete bunkum because from even the statistics, that they, they, they haven't even filled the rightful stipulated quota in most of the jobs. So it's actually the caste Hindus who continue to dominate and uh, underperform. Uh, so so it, it is actually a very clever argument that they devise to say that Dalit should be denied any space. This is, this is simply to say society should not be democratized. So you, you say you do not want a deepening of democracy, you don't want social democracy, so you oppose reservation. Because for Ambedkar, when he introduced this whole idea of compulsory aff a, a quota, it's not even affirmative action, it's technically not affirmative action. Uh, it's not diversity as it's fashionably known in the US. It is a mandatory, constitutionally stipulated must do thing. And this is flamboyantly violated by the most progressive people in India. Jawaharlal Nehru University which was reined over, the history department was reined over by Romila Tapar for 30 years and not a single Dalit was appointed to the faculty. Not one Dalit. Meaning the degrees which were given by JNU, which is the premier social sciences institute in India, <coughs> to Dalits, meaning they studied there, right? And MA and MPhil, and the faculty could not find a person who was, meaning they were bad. They didn't teach anybody so well that they could recruit. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's, if you really look at it, they should be pulled up and told, uh, you didn't do too well. And economics department, Center for Economic Studies there, Patnaiks, uh, these are all progressive left people. Uh, they haven't still found anybody who's a Dalit who could be recruited in JNU. So these are centers of exclusion. This is where untouchability is practiced in India. And being anti even if you're not anti-reservation in, 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 in uh, uh, vocal uh, terms, you end up being anti-reservation by excluding Dalits from your Midst. It could, it could be even places where they are not mandated, like India International Center in Delhi, which is an elite place where membership is uh, considered a premium and the, 
the rich and famous of Delhi congregate there, the intellectuals of Delhi congregate there. Again, not one Dalit. India Habitat Center, not one Dalit. So, if you really broaden this whole idea of where is reservation implemented and not, you will find that India is a very, very hollow democracy. So, over to questions uh, to the panel and comments. Mr. Hirekar, yes. Yes, sir. Sure, you refer Dr. Ambedkar um, uh, roundtable conferences. There were three roundtable conferences. Yes. Uh, Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar attended only three roundtable conferences. The record of the first roundtable conference shows that it was he who demanded from the British government political freedom for India. He stood for the dominion status for India leading to the full freedom, responsible government for India, order franchise, women's equality, and special safeguard for the untouchable. Neither Mahatma Gandhi nor Mr. Nehru attended this uh, con conference. Nevertheless, how this media have made them great political heroes of uh, freedom and supreme Dr. Ambedkar's Contribution to the freedom. Nobody has raised this question up till now. And our people are sleeping over it. What is your solution, Mr. Anand? Well, uh, my solution is as a publisher, I'm reprinting a lot of Ambedkar, trying to uh, package him well, because if you see the government of Maharashtra volumes which were published, they did, they did not reach out. It, it, it's a huge struggle. It took me six months to buy the 17 volumes of the government of Maharashtra publications in 1999 when I first acquired them. But the idea is, you know, that is why I say that non-Dalits need to engage with Ambedkar because he talked about everybody's issues. He, he, he talked about his sense of what is patriotism. I'll come to it tomorrow. I don't want to anticipate what I'm going to say tomorrow. Uh, his sense of who he belonged to was completely different. Though he has been relegated as, you know, uh, and, and, and re revival of interest in Ambedkar happens after 1990 centenary celebrations in India. Uh, that too only again mostly largely among Dalits. Uh, so the fact that his ideas have not percolated down, that he has not been regarded, but there was a media conspiracy. When when he gives this speech, Gandhi Ranade Jina is talking about how the Congress hates him and they, 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 he gives the speech and then prints it later. Uh, with Tatnes, R.K. Tatnes, who used to publish most of his speeches and uh, works uh, in Bombay in 1943. But Ambedkar clearly, even in that speech, records the fact that the Congress press, he keeps calling it the Congress press, the, the only nationalist press there was the Congress press, and in fact in his, one of his uh, articles on the press, he talks about how the media is dominated by, and he talks about the Associated Press in Tamil Nadu full of Tamil Brahmins and how they dominate it and how they are basically a uh, mouthpiece of the Congress and they give no publicity to his speeches. The fact that thousands of people attended his speeches, that his birthdays were celebrated. I mean, I, he, he was not for celebration of birthdays, but he had such a following. When people make such a big fuss over Gandhi and his following, it was a huge following. If you talk to somebody like Bhagwan Das, he'll tell you how there were huge numbers who used to come to Shimla just to meet him when he used to be a labor member of the Viceroy's Executive Council and come to Shimla, as a, uh, which was a summer capital. But the point is these, these things have been lost to our history simply because the Dalits then, as, as there was there's one essay which he writes called The Untouchables Have No Press. So, so they, since then, they, they, the problem has persisted. Kanchiram at one point thought of setting up a press and saying we'll have some kind of our own opinion. If, the rest of the opinion is dominated by BJP and Congress and contemporary India. He wanted to set up his own media, uh, which also he didn't succeed. He did buy a bit of land for that in Noida. And tribals and Dalits were not represented at all. So it is a serious problem. The media is completely uh, nationalist in that, uh, in, in a pejorative sense on this question. Sure. You mentioned that uh, this society should be related to a crisis. Yes. And then issues get raised. You know, we've gone through this uh, morning hearing how depressed and deprived and dispossessed the untouchables are. Do you think that 
they should come club together and create a crisis for a and a demand for a separate state in India because they cannot live together it seems so that is yes. demand is separate state okay. well, this was something that was considered way back in Ambedkar's time and it was even envisioned as a Achutistan kind of utopia but you know, I'll tell you why practically it's not possible even for a Bhaujan Samaj party to envision itself in so many words as Bhaujan Samaj party and function in Tamil Nadu where people don't understand any Hindi is going to be a problem where do you take and, and they have their own subcultures, language uh, kind of subcaste problems, prejudices against fellow Dalits so this unity, is, is they, they are divided by caste in, in Andhra Pradesh today, the biggest struggle within Dalits is about sub-categorization, meaning the reservation pie is there. Now, the Malas have dominated it, the Madigas want a share and there are about 28 cars. If you take UP, there are 78 or I don't know, correct me uh, Vidya, there should be 78, 88 sub cars within Dalits. And uh, uh, the important point Vidya was making this morning, Vidya Bhushan Rawat that is, uh, was when you begin this whole political democracy logic and parliamentary democracy first past the post system uh, the chamas can uh, join hands with brahmins and together do something and what happens to the churas and what happens to the uh, bhangis and what happens to several minority castes with which are very small in number within that so will they all come together and believe that there is a separate state what will be the language of that state if you create a separate state how many, I mean, the Dalits speak as many languages as there are languages in India. So, easily about 20. No, so, this is a question of mine. Is to create a crisis. To create a crisis, yes, the idea, the idea sounds good. But, you know, the, uh, more than that, I would say at every local level, at, at, as, as Swati was pointing out, at the village panchayat level, you need to create a crisis. And they are anyway separate. What is the question of forming a separate state? They are living in a separate vada. They are forced to live in a segregated ghetto. Uh, they are forced out of what is called uh, common areas. So they, they are already separated. So how will the separated lead a struggle to become separate? Or how will that create a crisis? The crisis will be created when you say, I want to come and draw and build a house right next to yours. I, I have money. I uh, went to Bombay. I mean, there was a, in 2008, a Dalit was killed. Uh, he worked for 35 years in uh, the uh, Western Railway. He go, goes back, uh, builds a house, digs a well, and then they just don't like him and they kill him. This is in Maharashtra. I mean, I don't have the specifics of the incident. It's there. So, so uh, you you create a crisis by showing off the fact that you own property and you can just buy a house and put tiles on your house. If you see, read the story Baluta uh, by this Daya Pawar, uh, it is about uh, putting tiles on your house and uh, being attacked by caste Hindus for having a tiled house. So, so these are the ways in which you create crisis but not by, I don't know you, you, if separate state will create a crisis. Babu has something to say. I just want, <coughs> I just want us to be careful and be wise and judicious in suggesting solutions. Now, what, what, what is this, let us create a separate state? Can we go a little further? What do you mean? When you have a three-year-old child, I exaggerate not, a three-year-old child in North India, in pursuit of a rubber ball that the child lost and enters a Thakur house and the child is killed, what, what, what state are you talking about? If you stay 10,000 kilometers away from India, India looks a small place and you can talk about dividing it and so on. That is not how you change the society. I think you have to talk about people. You have to talk about educating them. Have you ever seen any lasting change that has happened with just a gun and a, and a chaku? It doesn't happen. Out of frustration now and then we might say a few things like this, but this is no solution to the problem. The solution to the problem ultimately has to be legal. I mentioned this morning that we took some people into a temple. And mind you, the law in India is civilized. It's the ones who are supposed to implement it who are not. Now, we have to take advantage of the law that exists. When we took people to go into the temple in Dalitwara, we didn't just go barging. We could have just done that too with the police. But the next day we will have left the village and the Dalits Dalit will still be there. We've had one month of preparation with the people. 
starting with the head priest, we had the upper caste people sit down with us and talk. Then we invited the guests and IHU's president and everybody else and the press to cover the event. You change societies like this, not by throwing an empty, impotent <coughs> challenge that we can't really live up to. You can't save your three-year-old child. You can't enter your village temple. There's no business about separate states. Earlier, there was this question asked about who is a Hindu and and so on and so forth. K. B. Krishna did an analysis in the 1930s, I think. 30s, mm -hmm. uh, In the 1930s, I think, and he said, "You could be an atheist and still be a Hindu. All you needed to be qualifying for a Hindu is a caste." Exactly. And that is the problem. <laughs> it is not about your conviction about the nature of the universe. It is your station in society, where you can be and what profession you can follow. Having said all this, the real problem in my mind about the Indian caste system, Leo would be the one to talk about uh, the African, especially in Nigeria, is not that Hindu texts are being believed more today than they were 100 years ago. It is that because of the identity politics that V.B. Rawat reminded us about and cautioned us about, that these identities are crystallizing. Now, I've with despair, I hear some people telling me, oh, that B.T. Rashekar is my friend. I've known him for 30 years. Are you proud that you know B.T. Rashekar, that rabid anti-human? He is the one who wants to be friends with the Muslims because the Muslims are against the Hindus. Is that the basis for creating an alliance? Ultimately, what V.B. Rawat was saying earlier, that we need Dalit leaders who are also democratic. We need a movement whose vision and direction is imbued with the values and the ideals of democracy, of equality, of humanism, of rationalism, of critical approach to the texts that they claim to be authori um, authority. Without that basis, you will not liberate anyone, believe you me. They have tried it. They've tried it not once. Ambedkar is not the first one who tried to liberate people. He is one, one of the greatest of the last century but one in a long succession of people who tried to change things. We have to understand that. And after all, what will they do by creating a separate identity? That's a, a discussion for another day. Um, it is, in my opinion, it's no discussion for any day because there is no answer there. There is no pot at the end of that rainbow. You can never hold it. But there are practical ways of changing societies. Others have done it. Let us, I th may I suggest that we actually pursue a line of thinking and a line of action which will actually take us somewhere. And I say that again, because the Indian diaspora, both the Hindu, both the Muslim, and the Dalit diaspora is completely dealing with reality. There are, the world is full of email tigers. <coughs> sending emails about how we can be a separate entity, how we can liberate, and so on. But that is not how societies change. That is all I'm saying. Please come and live in India and understand the reality. And perhaps the perspective will be different. The Babu sounds, thank you, Babu. Uh, it sounds very practical and grounded, but it's not that he is, we are against utopia. Let me clarify that. There can be a utopia. A utopia, I mean, for, for uh, Ambedkar called India a Prabuddha Bharat. The last journal that he ran was Prabuddha Bharat. He thought about an India which is enlightened, and he thought the constitution. And if it, if, if, if let's take a, take an example. If the constitution is very well implemented, and we have absolutely no problems, uh, everybody gets drinking water, everybody has access to school, everybody. Has, I mean, you you would get rid of reservation in another 20 years if that is the case. The next generation would be completely. Uh, liberated by that and that's a utopia if you implement the constitution fully that's a realizable ut utopia you can hold it to account and do it but the separate state uh, doesn't seem workable at all to me even if you have a discussion on it for a day I mean you could have for a day or two or even a month and you can even bring out a book on it but it is it is a, it's a nice sensational idea and it was uh, not that people did not have not flirted with uh, 
the, uh, with the idea. Several Dalit activists have in, had in fact encouraged Ambedkar to think of a separate state for Dalits. He, he thought of at least creating a sense of community. As in, as in, it is necessary to create a sense of community sometimes. As free thinkers, yes. As Navayana Buddhist is what he tried and he didn't really succeed because it was a la relapse into Buddhism, uh, Hinduism very quickly for a lot of people. So those are doable utopias. But a separate state, I think in this day and age, and unless unless you're talking about Jews who have the ability to you know, network, have the money, have the clout, and did create a state, and the Palestinians were struggling for one, or the Sri Lankan Tamils were talking of one, these are states which are possible, which are politically sometimes necessary to explore. Whereas a Dalit state or a Dalit nation, well, not really possible. There's somebody here with a question. Yes, creating a separate state without changing hearts and minds doesn't solve the problem. It simply relocates it. Sure. Uh, Amarji, there. I just wanted to add a little bit, right? Uh, the concept of a, a state for Dalits alone, you know, assume that Dalits don't have any differences between them. And that they are uniformly homogeneous all over India. Now, we've seen this similar kind of concept, you know, the creation of Pakistan. When we, without going into the ins and out of it, we ended up with two Pakistans, East and West, and then we ended up with Bangladesh. We also have to learn from places like ex-Yugoslavia, you know. I think at the end of the day, Indian people will have to learn to live in harmony. It's going to take a lot of blood, sweat, tears, and what have you, to get rid of this caste system and untouchability from India. But at the end of the day, the Dalits have to then come to terms with living with the Brahmins and vice versa. I would say the, the Brahmins have to learn first. The Brahmins, the Brahmins have to learn first to treat Dalits as equal. And then Dalits also have to learn, but that comes later. That, that's not the first uh, requirement. You know, that comes later. That the Dalits also have to learn to live with the, the newly reformed Brahmins, if you like, yeah? But a separate state as such for Dalits, I think, is a, a bit of a no-brainer. It's a no-starter. We agree on that, right? But as far as utopia is concerned, I think I would like to make an, uh, an observation that it wasn't Sir Thomas More who invented the concept of utopia. You will be very much surprised to hear that he was a, an untouchable saint in the medieval time called Guru Ravidas, who actually come out with the concept of Begumpura, which was a city without sorrow, which had no taxes, which had no suffering. But that was utopia. How we implement that, well, that's a question for the future. But it was the Dalits who actually invented the concept of utopia. That, that's all I wanted to say. He has just published that book. Uh, there's a book. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. There's, 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 I mean, sometimes I'm, I'm considered, uh, you know, I'm considered uh, a good publisher but a bad businessman because uh, I don't write so much of There's a book lying there, last copy, Seeking Begumpura, which is written by Gail Omvet, who's a social historian and she has written a lot of books on uh, the Dalit movement and the caste question in India. And she talks about, she says exactly the same thing, that Thomas More might have done it uh, in, in Western society, but the idea, the imagining a utopia has been done by Ravidas and this, this very name Ravidas is what has rocked Vienna right now because uh, the Dalit Sikhs there wanted to refer to him as Guru Sant Ravidas. You know, they, they resent the fact that you have to uh, <coughs> refer to him as Sant Ravidas because they don't accept his saintliness or his sainthood. And this Ravidas envisioned this city of Begampura. And look at the root of the word, Begampura. I mean, it's so syncretic. It's not like he has derived it from Hinduism. And it's a city without sorrow, without taxes, where all men and women are treated equal. It, it was something that was not realized in his own lifetime or even now. But at least he, he was envisioning a utopia or a kind of a state of uh, living where you, you could all be happy. And, uh, the, and, it, and, and that book explores other utopias, including Prabuddha Bharat, up to Prabuddha Bharat. What was Periyar's utopia? What was Ayodhya's utopia? What was Pandita Ramabai's utopia? So there, there have been several, uh, starting from the Bhakti movement down to the modern period in India, people have, including Pule and his uh, idea of utopia. Uh, so there have been people who have envisioned a kind of a 
non-discriminating society. A society where there would be no discrimination. So it's not as if this has not happened. But none of them seem to have thought that we will take all these Dalits, homogenize them, and what, what do you teach them? What do you do with them? What, how do you uh, collapse the differences that exist within them? There's no such easy way. If you humanize everybody, if, you, if everybody turns out to be a decent human being and gives up caste, the baggage of caste and uh, the hi uh, baggage of hierarchy, uh, then you have a possibility of being liberated and say we could live where, wherever we are. Just a correction. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what Hirekar Saab said earlier about the uh, Ambedkar's contribution for Indian freedom. And I am coming to this because many of the Dalit intellectuals, Ambedkar, I feel that Ambedkar never fought for Indian independence. This, this comes from that thought, actually. That he never fought for the Indian independence because it was a Brahminical independence, not for the, He had these uh, fears, of course, but he was a nationalist that way. Even some of us uh, 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 cannot digest his later days' writings, actually, his post 40 writings, when he's writing about Pakistan and uh, Hindu and Muslim together. That that writings actually, but uh, a large number of people, because Ambedkar has written so much over a period of time that everybody used him according to his own convenience. And that's the that's the difficulty. Uh, but when he didn't attain, how can he become a, a, a freedom minded? No. Th th that the problem I'm saying is everybody is using Ambedkar according to his convenience, he according to the age. Injustice to Some, Ambedkar. That, that's what I'm saying. That's what you have to write now. And uh, Anand will publish that book. <laughs> but that one thing. Second thing I wanted to put on the issue of reservation. Uh, you see, uh, there are two things which are hitting the Dalits a lot and international people are sitting here have not talked about that. One is the so-called uh, liberalization process, the privatization process and that acquiring of land of the tribals and Dalits which has created a lot of crisis in India. And that is where you have to put your government under pressure. The other is the losing of jobs in the uh, government sectors. On the one side, when he was talking about 17.5% reservation for the Dalits. It has never been filled. The uh, middle classes, the government all conspire together to deny Dalits a right in the government. They say they don't have merits. But all the time, this meritophobia in the Indian upper caste actually has to be rebutted all the time. That's why people like Swati are here and Guruchar, uh, Gurinda. You see that, that also have, we have to uh, put pressure on the government. Why there is no, uh, uh, like in Indian judiciary, this once holy cow of Indian uh, system, there is no reservation for Dalits in, in the judiciary. We have uh, Justice Balakrishnan coming here, but I can say that he is a very, very uh, special case. When his name was mentioned by the former president of India, that he is one of the finest judges of India. There was a hue and cry by Indian media that the president is trying to, you know, uh, put the caste order again in, in this system. But if you go through the Indian judicial appointment system, it's horribly actually based on, you know, uh, patronism. And anybody who is a political person can be appointed as a high court judge. So just like there was a human yeah, yeah. Obama yeah, appointed yeah. Latin American Absolutely. Like so uh, I think these two things are very important. The Dalis, uh, after the privatization process, the, there are no jobs available. And the other is, and uh, this reservation is basically a participation in power. So unless they are there in the power structure, there will be discrimination against them all the time. And the other is, government has not done land reforms. We don't have a land reform ministry in India. And whatever little land we have with the Dalits and tribal is going to the private companies without uh, uh, their getting fair compensation, uh, fair re resettlement and rehabilitation. So these two issues are very important. Unless they are attended, I think uh, here uh, we can say that our government are doing good things. But the same government, UK government and the US government are promoting all these right-wing elements in India who are acquiring huge assets, huge land of Dalits. So we have a new Jamidari system today new colonization of the Dalits and tribals, and we must oppose it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gandhi said, scavenger children may remain scavenger without being or feeling degraded. Did he want to improve our position? Did he say, get them educated and uh, compete for 
um, administrative or manager position? Did you say that you're doing a service to society? Continue. I mean, nobody here is, uh, I hope, uh, fond of uh, Gandhi and his advocacy of caste and Varna. And Can you tell them exactly what Gandhi wrote on this question? Well, uh, lots of, there, there's, there's quite a bit of a myth about what Gandhi thought about the Balmiki or the Bhangi question. You know, the, the, one of the key things that he said is, this is the most honorable occupation. When the, the, and, and he said, uh, I'll again, I don't have the text before me, but uh, one of the things he says is, you're doing a noble occupation, you're doing what a mother does to a child, so this is very important, continue to do that. Not only that, you are doing such a service that it is scientific. Now, he, here he uses the language of science and rationalism to justify a terrible practice. He says, you should, no, no, I'm not justifying, I'm explaining to people who might think Gandhi is uh, pro-Dalit that he actually, actually is not. He, he is asking them to accept their fate and continue to do their caste-based occupation, which is, which is also not very historical. It is something that came about in the last 200 years. Let's not believe that 800 years ago Dalits were forced to do these kind of jobs. They were not. Uh, what Gandhi says here is, you need to examine, not only should you collect the stools and dispose of human excreta, you must examine the excreta and tell the person who, who's uh, shat, uh, I don't know what else to say, uh, that uh, examine the stools and tell them the qu uh, how the quality of it was, whether he's suffering from any problem and whether he needs to eat this kind of food. I mean, there, there's a paper I've read where I've read that he had a certain uh, kind of a food uh, uh, eating disorder. You know, basically it was all kind of an externalization of his own obsession with all kinds of elements that came out of the human body. He is somebody who wrote a letter on white discharge that women have. So we are supposed to think he is progressive because he d discussed white discharge. So he was somebody who was obsessed with fluids and uh, anything that came out of the human body and he expected the Dalits to give free advice and towards the end of that essay he says for this labor, this service provided to society, you are not to expect any material reward. You are supposed to give it out of your own free will. And this is science. He tells them this is scientific. The job that you are doing is scientific. Basically, he is asking them to do what, what, what happens in a pathology lab. Uh, and say, if there are worms in it, advise the person. And it, he grows into graphic detail in that. You know, Not as well as I am able to here. Because he was. He was somebody who was obsessed with these things. This whole... Uh, there is this very, uh, very sad moment in uh, Sham Benegal's film called The Making of the Mahatma where uh, Kasturba and Gandhi are fighting uh, some kind of you, me, you, me struggle over a pot. It's about who will clean the potty and they are fighting over it. I mean, it's ridiculous. And this whole idea that he said uh, everybody should clean their own toilets. It, at one level, it is about dignity of labor and trying to say, let's do our own jobs. But it was not something that he seriously implemented in his own ashrams. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was more for a kind of a symbolic uh, way of trying to say, well, I'm doing this and that's why I'm pro-Dalit. But when you immediately say only Bangis need to do this and they are doing a noble occupation, you are condemning them to something that uh, is so dehumanizing and romanticizing it. In, in fact, in India, if even today there are uh, 13 lakh manual scavengers. There's the official admitted figure. 6.7 lakh is the government figure, but they themselves admit that uh, non uh, then uh, non regularized labor, the contract labor, everything scales it up to uh, 1.3 million. If you have to put it in million, they're still there. It's because Gandhian thinking has dominated policy making in India. It has dominated policy making to the extent that in the Safai Karamchari, uh, National Safai Karamchari Development Corporation, if you go, you'll find a Gandhi picture. You don't find Ambedkar's picture where he came, simply said, stop doing this. Do starve to death, uh, do anything, uh, just go hungry, but don't do this. If you have to say that I have to do this in order to earn my bread, don't do this. Educate yourself, change your profession, do anything but this. And he was not, not really considered a friend of the Bangladesh. Though it is a matter of fact that in the Scheduled Caste Federation in Himachal Pradesh, the Balmikis uh, led a strike, sweeper strike in 1943. It was led by Teluram Baitwan, who was part of Scheduled Caste Federation. He was a Bal. I mean, 
to use balmiki is also a very problematic word for me i don't use words like balmikis yeah, and bangis especially if you have spoken to bhagwan das he talks of them as lal begis he talks of them as people who are forced i mean this, these are all completely derogatory terms it's like continuing to use terms like nigger and uh, saying that i i want to get away with it because as a self description uh there should be there do it yourself in this country they do it yourself system so let let the brahmin do their own uh, Sure, sure, sure. They must, they must, they must demand reservations in this sector yes. for sure. But they don't. Uh, <laughs> they must be, they must be given, not demand. You know, it should be like you know. This morning, Babu was saying, liberty must be given, um, must be taken, not yes. given. Yes. But it is the reverse in this case. You know, you must give them, give them the liberty to work on toilets and uh, uh, clean. I mean, it is. See, as long as that profession is not associated with a single caste and with a single community. Then you know, then, then it's not as if you know when uh, when Dalit Panthers in Tamil Nadu went and showed uh, chappals and you know when people fling chappals and we pro we say ah it's one form of protest be it on Bush or uh, Chidambaram Chidambaram or when people take in India they take uh, brooms and then they say this is one form of protest. See, it's it's also this whole internalization of lack of of, of dignity of labor, of devaluing dignity of labor. and a sense of internalized indignity of labor that makes you think that the broom or the shoe is a symbol of protest so dalits are also in a sense victims and which is why babu was right in saying that it's it's a diabolical system which makes the victims themselves perpetrate what what they are facing which is why the, this particular community the uh, the lal begis the people who are involved with manual scavenging are dalits among dalits in the sense they are most discriminated there are uh, communities in Tam uh, in tamil nadu and andhra pradesh i can tell you where within dalits there is huge discrimination people won't want to talk to them won't want to marry them their bastis are a little separate their quarters are a little separate from uh, the other dalits if there is a malawada there will be a separate wada for uh, madigas and further separate one for those who are dakkilis and domes who are involved in this kind of work so it's an endless cycle it's a vicious cycle and ambedkar had that's why he was a true humanist leader in the sense he talked about all professions he just didn't talk about what the mahars and the balutedari system and the vatandar uh, work that the mahars were doing he talked about all kinds of professions untouchables were forced to uh, forced into performing anyway we are kind of slowly digressing from lesson lessons from social and constitutional intervention uh, any last question because we'll end on time or before time so that we can go ahead with the film screening okay so i can see the time right before me there is one question actually i would like to appreciate uh, the forum that they have uh, focus on the issue, issue of untouchability and discrimination throughout the world from the since morning we have heard from different part of uh, the world the caste system is exist and the untouchability exists as per the topic now you have focus that is dalit woman and reservation that is three different topic that is dalit woman and reservation i would like to say one thing that dalit woman and reservation is something which is most vast topic and reservation means you are talking about morning we have seen one uh, film the dalit woman was uh, taking the excretor human excretor from uh, the toilet trees yeah so she is she is highlighting that i am not getting uh, to drink water i i can't expose myself to the high caste uh, hindus or something like that and the reservation topic one woman who is dalit and the reservation topic the person who has the student who has got the reservation advantage and they have learned a lot like i am not talking about just uh, ambedkar's community from maharashtra or from up's community uh, from mayawati's community from up the reservation who has got they have not fought for the untouchability we appreciate we should appreciate here we are talking on the topic which got the reservation but they have not highlighted but we should come out come out with the some solutions like as babu said that babu was talking on the, the on the medical fraternity terms like treating the disease not the patient mm -hmm. and separate state or separate uh, country is not a solution because this system varna varna vyavastha varna system is including the shudras and ati shudras you can call untouchables and outcast so we should come out with the some uh, strong solution which is secular 
within this two days of conference and i would like to just highlight as raut sir said the conference which is going on the nehru center just would like to highlight that ambedkar memorial lecture is uh, presented by uh, will presented by chief justice of india and the topic is judicial activism and the enforcement of socio economical rights who would like to uh, attend the conference and uh, can ask the same questions or who are the questions coming up after the presentation they can ask to directly to the chief justice of india uh, will request for your name so we can distribute the invitations thank you very much saturday saturday where is that it's on the 13th of uh, june on this saturday 5 o'clock at nehru center yeah so note down nehru center 13 june saturday 5 o'clock to kg balakrishnan is here yeah yeah kg balakrishnan okay chief justice of india okay 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 uh, have, uh, the names of the persons who are so you can as we wind up as people exit the place they could probably give uh, the list of names to and um, rahul yeah so rahul will collect the names and if you want to be invited to that event he, uh, get in touch with him uh, and because the invitation is on the listening of uh, high commissioner of india yeah you need to invite to get in there yeah especially because if the chief justice of india is coming they're not going to let anybody I mean, like people. Some of them came in here today. It's fine, but probably there they're not going to let you in like that. Uh, I don't think uh, I H E U said. And if I found the other, they won't let you in. Nice people. Yeah, and they also okay. I'll read this. It's non-transferable for security reasons. Please print and bring this e invite along with photo ID for entry. It's the Ambedkar Memorial Lecture. judicial activism and enforcement of socio economic rights i am delighted that kg balakrishnan is coming for ambedkar memorial lecture because i mean he is a ch- i tell you why i mean uh, the, the the system in india corps those kind of dalits who do not really want to talk about ambedkar and his legacy and if you really do like just as ramaswami did he didn't get too far he didn't get this far as kg balakrishnan good we have a dalit as a Uh, chief justice and all that but good also to see him for instance even with kr narayan and i would say only after he became president of india he started reading and rereading ambedkar which is good so these kind of institutions make them come to ambedkar that's a good thing that's a good thing uh, and and on this whole constituent assembly thing and since we are talking about constituent what i was delighted that this morning you know pahadi said two very important things that the constituent assembly in nepal has uh about uh, hun- uh, how many representatives from uh, dalit 50 70 no no uh, dalit dalit is 50 50 dalit. and out of which 50 50 are women and men 93 hmm? 93 women 93 no it is 93 something whatever it is it is 197 women in a 601 that number i remember 197 women in a 601 house of uh, in the constituent assembly i mean in 1947 46 uh, 49 when indian constitution was being written there were hardly any women and there were only dalit soldiering along was ambedkar he was quite hamstrung you know in the, in the sense in which he couldn't do a lot of things if you really want to see what is ambedkar constitution read states and minorities which he wrote in 1946 august uh, one year before independence that's his true visionary document he couldn't do as much in others but my point is if nepal is doing this uh we need to learn something you know india has this whole bully attitude in south asia of uh in the subcontinent of telling other neighboring states what to do the big brother attitude but there's a lot they can learn because nepal in the durban review conference uh, i know babu is skeptical of these uh, un and durban initiatives post durban initiatives i'm uh, not skeptical okay. i only think that shouldn't be the main focus of the no i i, I would think that you know there's a percolation effect it's like you know if you write the constitution how is uh, how is anything going to change at the village level but it does help you know if you have the if you tomorrow have uk passing a law which says we we recognize caste discrimination as part of race relations act then it's a huge signal to india it's a huge wake up call and down the line of european union does such things then it's a huge diplomatic pressure on india so these these with with 7% economic growth it is nothing for india yeah. well <laughs> it is nothing for india yeah. you must realize yeah. the nature of a bully state yeah. and that is the fundamental thing <laughs> about uh, racism they know about slavery but they do they are they do not know about untouchability in uh, india so they they should be media to awaken their western people on this
Okay, so I think we'll call it a day for uh, today, and and we of course have uh, the film, and which will be screened uh, in another.